Mercy Me is coming to Pittsburgh. The Together Again Tour with Mercy Me, Crowder, and special guest Andrew Ripp. Thursday, October 5th. Bring your family and friends to the PPG Pain Serena in Pittsburgh for Mercy Me, Crowder, and Andrew Ripp live in concert. Three multiple award-winning artists on one stage for one night. Let your spirit soar, your heart sing, and your faith ignite. Mark your calendars for Thursday, October 5th. Get your tickets now at mercyme.org. It's exciting that the business boutique was made for you. I know that I can make a difference in people's lives, and I want to do that. Hearing a lot of what other people are going through is really healing in a sense and motivating as well. I have the world in my hand, and I can do whatever I want. Learning from some of the top leaders who can make these dreams a reality is just so exciting. It ignited a passion in me to know she can do that, we can do that too. I'm so blessed to have heard the podcast that led me to this moment. Welcome to the Business Boutique Podcast. I'm Christy Wright, and today we are talking about how to make money and not feel guilty about it. Later on in the show, I'll be interviewing author and speaker Rabbi Daniel Lappin about the goodness of business and making money. You'll also hear from a woman just like you who changed the way she thought about money, and it made an impact in her life and her business. But first, I want to share with you an experience I had a few years ago that's really stuck with me. I was coaching one of my clients named Margaret around her fitness business. And this experience of coaching her really has stuck out in my mind because I noticed something about one of the things that we struggle with in business. My client's name was Margaret. And I remember after several sessions of working with her, she constantly struggled to make money. Week after week, we'd work through her marketing plan. She had a great fitness business. She worked with her clients on nutrition. She had a great base and she worked really hard. But regardless, week after week, she really struggled to still make money. And so finally, one week, I got the impression that what was going on was more than just her marketing plan. It was more than a problem with sales. So I just asked her point blank. I said, Margaret, do you believe that making money is bad? And, you know, she kind of shifted in her seat a little bit. She shuffled. She got a little squirmy. And then finally, she said, almost in a whisper, well, I just don't feel like I should be taking money from people. And I looked at her. And I said it as kindly as I could, but I said, you know what, Margaret, then you will never make money. Because the truth is, if you don't believe in the goodness of business and making money, you will never have a good business and make money. And believe it or not, Margaret's situation is not that different from many of the other women that I work with. We don't realize it, but our beliefs about money are what shape our ability to make money. We have this idea that somehow making money is bad. And it's interesting because you see that come out in the words that we use. If you'll notice, Margaret didn't say, I feel guilty for earning money. I feel guilty for making money. She said, I feel guilty for taking money. And when we focus on the wrong words, which are usually very indicative of what we believe about those words, then of course we're going to struggle with making money. So instead of thinking about what you're taking from your customer, I want you to focus on what you're making. For example, you're not taking money from them. You're not reaching into their purse and into their wallet and stealing their cash. Instead, you're giving them something. You're giving them incredible value. You're meeting their needs and solving their problems through your products and services. You're making money. That means that you're earning it. You're working hard and you deserve the payment that you receive. When we change our focus, instead of from taking to actually making, it changes everything. You start to realize that you earned that money, and that's something you can feel good about. Because the truth is, if you don't believe in the goodness of making money, you're always going to hold yourself back. My friend Rabbi Lappin, who will actually be with us in a few minutes for an awesome interview, talks about this in his book, Thou Shall Prosper. He talks about the morality of business, how being in business is actually a really good thing. But he has a great quote that has stuck with me for years, and he says this, Very few people can excel at occupations about which they entertain moral reservations. Now, Rabbi Lappin uses fancy words, and he's very smart, but I will break it down for you because let's be honest, you're not going to be able to do well at something that you feel bad about, right? Of course, you're not going to take steps in a direction of an end result that you believe is bad or immoral in some way. You're going to always hold yourself back and feel guilty and doubt yourself if you believe that making money is a bad thing. 
But what I want to talk about today is that making money is not a bad thing. In fact, making money is a really good thing for a whole lot of reasons. And the truth is, if you want to run a business, I mean a real business, then you've got to make money. And I understand, trust me, I work with women at all stages of business, those that are running very successful companies, all the way down to those that just have a dream and an idea. And many of the women that I work with, regardless of where they are on their journey, they didn't get into business on purpose necessarily. Some of them just started out doing a hobby. And that hobby kind of grew, and then they got requests, and then they thought, hey, I could make money at this. And it all kind of evolved naturally and organically. But the reality is, when you get into business kind of accidentally, it's easy to think you have a business, but you continue to treat it like a hobby. But let's go ahead and break down the difference between a hobby and a business. A hobby costs you money. A business makes you money. And that's what our goal is, right? Our goal is to run a business. So if you want to run a business, you've got to make money. That means that we've got to feel good about it and we've got to find ways to do it well. So we have to find ways to make money to run our business, but also we want to feel good about it. Now, if you're running a nonprofit, I don't want you to tune me out here because this is for you. Regardless of your tax status, for-profit or not-for-profit, every business needs to earn a profit. Because do you want to know what a nonprofit organization is that doesn't make a profit? It's out of business. We all have the same responsibility to manage our business well, and that means earning a profit. That means earning money. Now, I've told you guys that earning money in your business is a good thing. It actually allows you to do a lot of things. Let's look at some examples. First of all, earning money in your business means that you get to stay in business. That's a good thing. That's what you set out to do in the first place, so making money allows you to do that. The second thing that earning money does is it allows you to earn an income for your family. That's a good thing. Your work is worth something. You have something to offer, and it is not a bad thing when you get paid for that and you get to provide for your family in the process. The third thing, when your business grows because it gets so big and it's earning so much money that you actually need to hire people, well, then earning money in your business means that you're able to provide jobs for people. That's a good thing. And of course, earning more money in your business means that you can help and serve more people, which of course is a good thing. Rabbi Lappin has another quote that I love so well, where he says, when you serve the marketplace well, that means when you take care of your customers, they will give you certificates of appreciation with president's faces on them. Y'all, they're going to give you money. They want to pay you because you served them well. So when you look at it this way, you realize that running a business, meeting needs, taking care of people's problems, it's not a bad thing or a greedy thing. It's a good thing. And as a bonus, they're going to pay you for it to show you how much they appreciate it. Now, I know that some people have this idea that money's bad or being wealthy is bad. You may see it in our culture or in the media, or maybe your ideas about money were shaped by your parents or someone else in your life. Maybe somewhere along the way, you might have been influenced by this idea that if you win— If you become successful and you earn a lot of money, that suddenly you're going to be a bad person and you've got something to be ashamed of or feel guilty about. But the truth is, money is not good or bad. And having money or not having money does not make you a good or bad person. The real truth of it, if we're going to be totally objective here, is that money is amoral. That means that it's not good or bad. It's kind of like a brick. A brick is not good or bad. It's not a really nice brick, it's not a friendly brick, and it's not a bad brick or an evil brick or an angry brick. It's just a brick. But when you put it in the hands of a person, it can be used for good or used for bad. If you take that brick and you throw it through someone's windshield of their car, that's not very nice. That's not a good thing. But what if you took it and built a cathedral with that brick? That's a good thing. But guess what? The brick didn't decide. It's just a brick. The person decided. The character of the person decided how that brick was used. And you know what? Money is the exact same way. It's not good or bad. It's not nice or evil or very moral or very immoral. It's just money. But when you put it in the hands of a person, it becomes a tool that can be used for good or used for bad. And money's also a magnifier. It just makes you more of what you already are. So if you're a jerk and you earn a lot of money, you're just a huge rich jerk. It becomes more apparent how much of a jerk you are because you have so much money to show that. But if you're a giver, if you're a generous person, if you're a kind person and you earn a lot of money, 
Think of all the people you could help. Think of the difference you can make. Think of the quality of your business you could improve because you were entrusted with so much money to help people with. But you know what? The money didn't decide. The character of the person decides how the money is used. And when we understand this, we can change our beliefs about money in a way that enables us to go win and win unapologetically. You don't have to be sorry for being successful. That means you helped people. That means what you're doing matters and it's needed and it's worthy and it's good. And guess what? As a result, people are willing to pay you for it. It doesn't matter how great your business is because if you don't believe in it, no one else will either. It starts with you, your beliefs around your business and your beliefs around winning in your business and earning money starts with you. But here's the great news. When you do believe in your business, when you do believe in the goodness of what you're doing and serving your customers well, it comes out not only in how you talk about it, how you sell your products and services, how you market it, but it also affects your bottom line in your bank account. It affects the numbers and it affects everything. So many people that I work with have trouble marketing their business. They have trouble selling, but it's because they struggle with being sorry about winning. But when you know what you're doing is good, you don't have to be sorry. You can stop being sorry in your business and you can start talking about your business with pride where you hold your head high. You make direct eye contact, your shoulders are back and you smile because you know that what you're talking about is really going to help someone. You don't have to shrug your shoulders and be apologetic and explain and justify your prices or your products or your schedule or your policies. You don't have to apologize for any of that. You don't have to be sorry for winning in business. Instead, you have permission to win. You have permission to be proud of what you're doing, of stepping into the gifts God has given you and helping people with them. When you do that, watch what happens. Watch how your business takes off. Watch how your customers grow. Because when you believe in your business, other people will too. And when you stop being sorry and you actually share your business with pride, it's amazing to see how people will get it. People will be bought in and they will want to be a part of what you're doing because you're proud of it and they want to be a part of it. I always remind my coaching clients, you teach people how to treat you. And so if you act sorry about your business when you talk about it, People are going to think you have something to be sorry for. And you know what? You don't. You don't have anything to be sorry for by winning in business. So if you could understand this concept, if you could understand that what you're doing is good and the money you're earning from the business that you're doing is good, then it will change everything about your business. When you believe in the goodness of business and making money, then, then you can finally have a good business and actually make money. And I'm excited because today I have someone with me that is an expert on this topic. He is author of the book, Thou Shall Prosper, and he knows how to help you win in business unapologetically. I'm so excited to have Rabbi Daniel Lappin with us today. Rabbi Lappin, thank you for being with us today. I appreciate you inviting me. So Rabbi Lappin, for me, your book, Thou Shall Prosper, really has affected my beliefs about money in my own life, but also what I coach women when they're starting businesses. And you have this whole idea that business is good and worthy and making money is a good thing. And I'll tell you, I see this all the time with women that I coach in businesses. We just feel guilty. We feel guilty for charging. We feel guilty for our profit. We feel guilty for earning money. So I would just love if we could start out and you tell us a little bit about some of those ideas you teach and Thou Shall Prosper about how this is not a bad thing, right? It's not a bad thing. Right. And the only thing I'd correct, Chrissy, is that it's not my idea at all. I wish it was. I'm just not that Mm. smart. (laughs) But Thou Shall Prosper is the first book. And interestingly enough, publisher made me take out a whole lot of stuff. They said, oh, this is too religious and this Mm. is too... And I said, well, it's the blood of the whole thing, you know. And they came back after the first book was a stunning success and a bestseller. They came back and said, oh, you've probably got all the stuff we told you to take out. (laughs) And I said, yeah, it's like the best part. And (laughs) that that became uh, business secrets from the Bible. Mm. And so uh, where this flows from is asking a question that I asked a number of years ago. And I just said, you know, I wonder if anybody has looked into why Jews are disproportionately good with money. Now, Mm -hmm. as soon as I started saying that, I made all my fellows in the Jewish community very uncomfortable. Mm. And I thought, well, now that's interesting. 
It's as if I said, has anybody noticed that Jews make up most of the bank robbers in the world? And uh, <laughs> that's how they reacted. Right. And all I said was that Jews are disproportionately good with money. You know, now obviously, are there poor Jews? Sure. But 2% of America's population being Jewish, the annual Forbes 400 list of the 400 richest Americans, you know, do the arithmetic, should be eight Jews. Mm -hmm. It's always about 75 to 150. Wow. So massive overrepresentation. And everywhere else, you look exactly the same thing. It's not only true in America. It's not only true in the 21st century. But it's been true for centuries in good places and in bad, in hospitable regimes and in terrible tyrannies. Jews, typically. You know, the question was why. And I, I looked into this and I realized that it was the kind of research that only a Jew could do. <laughs> if I was not of Jewish ancestry and I did this research, they'd call me a bigot. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's the best indication that people really think that making money is proof of bad behavior. At the very least, you're a greedy, uncaring human being. Right. And I thought, well, let's look into this because we've got to find out why Jews are good at this. I mean, you know, what is it? Is it the food we eat or is it a set of tips and tools and techniques derived directly from ancient Jewish wisdom and the pages of the Hebrew Bible mm. that anybody can benefit from. So talk us through your first one. Talk me through a little bit of chapter one of Thou Shall Prosper when you talk about the nobility of business. Yeah. And this is an idea that I just think you're right. You know, one of the things I've heard you talk about is how culture shapes our idea about business and wealth and it demonizes it, right? You see this in our culture of the rich, evil people and the wealthy and, you know, the little man just can't get ahead. So talk to me about this whole idea of why we have these negative beliefs and what you found about the real truth about yeah. business. Well, first of all, the damage the wrong beliefs can do is incalculable. Mm. When I first immigrated to the United States of America, here's the funny thing. Very soon after I arrived, a guy, his name was Philippe, an amazing fellow, but his last name is Petit. He illegally and surreptitiously strung a wire between the two towers of the old World Trade Center, and he walked across it. And then he sort of teased the cops who came up onto the roof of the World Trade Center when everybody noticed he was sort of teasing them. And as soon as he'd come close to the end where they were trying to grab him, he danced back into the middle of the wire. I mean, like he was having the time of his oh, life, yeah. you know, a thousand feet above the streets in New York. Yeah. And I, I, I was absolutely entranced with this and I became obsessed with the guy. And it turned out he did a documentary afterwards on the whole thing. And he speaks about walking the high wire like oh. this. And other people have said it as well, which is you don't look down. You look at the end of the wire. You look where you're going. Mm -hmm. And he knows that he can stay on that wire. But he also knows that if anything happened to his mindset, mm -hmm. over he goes. Mm. And this is so important because we are not bodies that have a soul. We are souls wrapped up in a body. Mm. And what our souls do determines what our bodies are going to be able to do. Um, there's a lot of stuff on holistic medicine. Anybody who doesn't believe that's an idiot because mm -hmm. the amount your mind affects your health is really – I mean, doctors now know this. Sure. In the same way, your business success is a function of what is going on in your heart, what is going on in your soul, what is going on in your mind. And if any decent person, if we deeply believe that making money is like taking money away from people, if we deeply believe that being profitable and becoming wealthy is a sign that you've hurt other people, you simply will not be able to do so successfully. You simply will not be able to make any money. You will be like Philippe Petit looking down from the high wire mm -hmm. and it's dooming, just absolutely doomed. So I realized then that one of the key things that Jews had going for them was that they did not believe that poverty means virtue. Mm -hmm. God doesn't love poor people any more than he loves rich people. Right. And the truth is that it's much harder for a wealthy person to be virtuous than for a poor person because a poor person doesn't have a lot of choices. Right. But to be virtuous when you can do a lot of things because you have the means, now that takes some doing. Right. And so this notion that God cares more for poor people, then it's simply not true. Right. In fact, the biblical injunction in the Old Testament to judges is very clear. Do not not favor the poor or the rich. Mm. But the poor, a lot of people, when a culture becomes more and more socialistic, there will be this belief that the poor are somehow virtuous. Right. And that the underdog always has to be stood up for and that the underdog is always a victim. Well, wait a second. That suggests that no poor person is ever complicit in his own fate. It means that no poor person 
ever did anything to contribute. So I realized something which is painful for people when I say it, and you can just believe me when I tell you it's painful for me too, but it's a fundamental truth. And that is that if, God forbid, somebody has ill health, health problems, it happens. It's not your fault. If people have family problems, you know, you can do everything right and have problem kids. Things go wrong, you know. It's not your fault. But if you have financial problems today, it's because you made bad decisions yesterday, period. Right. And that's a hard thing for people to realize. And the culture said, oh, you're blaming the victim. Who says the victim never does anything to bring about his own problems? Right. And this is really important to understand. What is it? Such an element of personal responsibility because it helps you look in the mirror and go, okay, I'm in control of my future. I'm in control of my actions. And that's one of the things I tell women, especially with business, is I say, you can't complain about that which you permit. Yeah, that's You're right. undercharging, Beautiful. underpricing. Yeah. You're giving things away for free because you feel guilty or manipulated right. into it. And then you're complaining that you're not making money, but it's how you're running your business exactly. that's leading to those exact results. And yeah. one of the things I've seen, you and I have talked about this with the idea that somehow business is bad or you're greedy if you're taking money from another person because they use the word take versus make. And I talked to my mom about this. My mom runs a cake shop, Rabbi Lappin. And when I asked her about why she feels guilty for charging, because I was just doing some research on women in business and I was walking with her one day. And I said, Mom, I said, why do you think this is so hard for us? And she said, well, Christy, when someone asks me the price of a cake, and I say the price of the cake is $45, in the back of my mind, I know that that cake only costs me $4 in ingredients. And so I feel like I'm taking advantage of this <laughs> yeah, person in yeah. $41. Well, aside from the fact that that's not even a remotely accurate assessment of cost, that aside, what she was saying was profit equaled greed. Right? That's like right. just making a profit in your company equals yes. somehow greed right. and selfishness. And I just think that is such a hurdle for these women because as you talk about, you are not going to take steps towards an outcome that you believe is bad. I think the quote from your book is, very few people can excel at occupations at which they have moral reservations. This is your Precisely. words, not mine. They're fancier words than how I would say it. But it's very true, right? Like we're going to self-sabotage because we believe the outcome's bad. That's an amazing story about your mom and so illustrative, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. really terrific. When I wrote Business Secrets from the Bible, I remember on a radio interview, somebody said to me, and so how long did it take you to write? And I thought for half a moment, and I said, approximately 35 years to <laughs> uh, figure out what to write, and then about two months to actually type it up. Right. And, and that's kind of your mom's situation as well. If everybody can produce that cake, they wouldn't be in the shop asking about it. Right. And so it's a summation of everything she is. It's her personality, it's her skills, it's her experience. The least important part of the whole cake is the ingredients. Right. That's a great point. That's a great perspective. And I think for our listeners, really it starts with believing in the value that they offer. And that's one of the hurdles as well is sometimes they undervalue their strengths. They think, oh, well, this is easy to everyone or there's nothing unique about my business. But when you start to realize the unbelievable uniqueness that you were created with and the value that you offer the marketplace, then you can believe exactly what you're yes. saying, which is you have something unique to offer and it's valuable and it's worth someone paying for. And it's, look, it's really important. Maybe this might be something for her to know about as well. And that is, we should talk for half a moment on what is the definition of value? Mm, that's good. What is the value of the new BMW 6 with a 12-cylinder engine, which I love? <laughs> and I very much hope to purchase one soon. What is the value of that car? Well, it's easy to know because it is what anyone's willing to pay for it. Right. And it's sticker priced at $84,000. And guess what? Apparently, its value is a little bit more this week because there's a shortage of them and people are paying over the price. Wow. Okay, so the value of it today is $90,000. How about in two weeks' time? Well, there's a whole bunch of them coming off the ship from Munich, Germany. So value is going to be back down at 84. Okay, I buy one, drive it home. Somebody says to me, how much did it cost? I say $84,000. He then says to me, and what's it worth? Well, it's obviously worth $84,000 to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't pay it. Sure. But if I wanted to sell it tomorrow, what's it worth? Well, it's now a second-hand car and it's worth a whole lot less. Value is strictly what the market is willing to pay for it. What is the value of some stupid daubings on a canvas, you know, that my nine-year-old would be embarrassed to submit in an art project? Well, at Sotheby's, a piece of garbage like that recently sold for $11 million. 
And so what is the value of that thing? Well, if it was that value to me, I'd have bought it, but it isn't. Right. But it is value that to somebody, that's right. why it's sold. Right. And so Christie's mom, if you're listening, the value of that cake is what people are willing. You see, if you used a gun and you hijacked somebody on the sidewalk, brought them into your shop and said, I won't let you go till you give me $40 and take this cake away from me, I would not say the cake is worth $40. Right. But if people voluntarily figure that they'd want to do it, that's the value. Right. And it's nothing but sheer arrogance to think otherwise. It means you know better than they do. Right. That's a very good perspective, too. And I love how so much of your teaching around this idea is just reframing for us our beliefs. Because like you said, our beliefs shape our actions, and so it's affecting our bank account, but it really starts with this undercurrent of belief that value's not there or no one's willing to pay for it. I mean, that's a belief these women struggle with. No one will pay for this, and it's because we don't believe in the value ourselves. And, and they haven't tried. Right. Now, I mean, if they really, really, really tried and people fall away, then maybe you have overpriced it. You know, we can do that. I've done that. And you back off and say, well, guess what? There's a discount this week and every week until, until sales <laughs> build up. Yeah, but it depends how badly the market wants what you've got. That's just a measure of how effectively you are serving God's other children. You constantly bring it back to that because what we're talking about here is so often we think of, oh, it's sales and I don't want to be salesy and that type of thing. But you're talking about business from the perspective and through the lens of business is good because you're taking care of God's children. Business is good because you are serving people well. So talk to us a little bit about that idea, because I know you talk about that a lot, and that's something that reframes for us where we don't have to feel guilty about it because we're serving people. Yeah. Well, on a few occasions, I've been invited to give the uh, commencement day speech for a college, and I never get invited back, and I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> invariably, some speaker or another before me gives a speech and says how wonderful it is to give back by going into public service. And then I get up and I say, look, with all due respect to the previous speaker, obviously I have a different take, otherwise you wouldn't have invited me here to just amplify what you've already heard. It makes no sense. So let me tell you how I look at it. First of all, I distrust any occupation which needs a euphemism. Now, we all know that going into public service is a euphemism for going into politics. Mm. And I am very disappointed at the thought of all you students going into politics, because that means that there's going to be a thousand new hands in my wallet, because you guys all <laughs> have to be paid. And the only way of paying you is by taxes. And so if somebody were to say to you what you really ought to be doing, I would tell you what you ought to be doing. And that is, you ought to be going into business and trying to make a lot of money. Because mm. however much money you make, you have delivered more value to the rest of us than the money you made. Otherwise, we wouldn't have given you the money. And so please forget this idea of going into, quote, public service. We really don't need any more politicians. The secret of ancient Jewish wisdom is find out the area in which you can help the most people the most mm. and then learn to love it. Mm, that's good. And that's not being crass or commercial. That's being a lover of God's children. That money is nothing but a measure of how badly people need you to help them in those areas. Go and do it and learn to love it. I think that's such a great example, too, because you just give people such permission to win. In a culture where success is so demonized, getting ahead is such Completely. a bad thing, <laughs> yeah, right. that you're giving people right. permission to win and not only win, but feel good about it in, yes. a, in a way that they're proud of. They're proud to talk about their business. And one of the things I tell women all the time is when you change your beliefs about making money, how you talk about your business changes. You're not so apologetic when you say your price and these types of things. So I think this is so valuable. So Rabbi Lappin, I would love it if as we wrap up, if you would just leave our listeners, which are probably in the beginning stages of starting a business, maybe they have one that's off the ground. Let's leave them with a few words of encouragement of kind of permission to go win and to do this thing and do it well. Absolutely, yes. You know, it's a very key verse in understanding ancient Jewish wisdom on money is what God says. And it's after the creation and God looks at everything he made, he says, as it was good and it was great. Everything God made, he likes. The first time he gets grumpy is when he sees Adam and he says, not good for man to be alone. <laughs> yeah. And this isn't just because God wants Adam to be married. It's that he makes a statement that it isn't good for humans to be disconnected from one another. And this is true also for parents. I remember the time my kids stopped squabbling. Now, you wouldn't know anything about squabbling kids, I'm sure. But my <laughs> kids squabbled from the day they were born with each other until a magical moment. I don't know exactly when it was. My wife could probably name the date. But there was a certain point at which they started 
loving one another and caring for one another and doing things for one another. And I got such a high from that. And I still do whenever I hear that they are helping one another and doing things for one another. It gives us a little insight into how God feels mm. when we care for one another and we do things for one another. And getting paid for it in no way diminishes it. One of the people who consulted with me makes wigs for women who've gone through chemotherapy and had hair loss. And one of her friends came to her and said, you know what, I always thought you were a good human being, but now I see you're not ashamed to make money off suffering ill people. Mm. And she was so broken up and so distraught that we actually had to spend quite a lot of time for me to help her understand and see where this is all going. That That is not true. The fact is she wouldn't do it. She wouldn't be able to do it on a free basis. Right. It's not possible. Right. And so what she's doing is keeping on providing this incredibly valuable service. Absolutely. You know, it's like sometimes I ask somebody to come over and help me do something, a child of a friend of mine, I needed some work done. He happened to be good at it. At the end of it, I gave him $35. And he said, oh, my dad said to come over and do you a favor. You really don't have to pay me, Rabbi Lap. And I'm fine with it. I said, you don't understand. You did such a great job. I'm going to need you again. And I can't ask you to come over again as a favor. That's, right. you know, that's abusing you. So I want you to take it because I want you to pick up the phone and come running over next time I call. It's important to understand the role of money. We don't diminish ourselves by being paid. We elevate ourselves. Mm. And it's such affirmation. I love how you talk about when you serve your customers well, they will give you certificates of appreciation with president's faces on them. And it's, it's just exactly such a good it word. It really is the affirmation from the marketplace yeah. that you're winning and you are serving them well. Rabbi Lappin, thank you so much for taking some time to share your wisdom with us. And I know that your books have been such a resource to me and they will be to our listeners as well. So thank you for well, some, taking I, some time I with us. I can't tell you how excited I am about Business Boutique and to bring these ideas as you do. You're doing something that is truly going to change the country. It really is empowering women to make money, feel good about it, and be contributing parts of the economy. I'm thrilled to be part of it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now, this episode, I want you to hear the story of a woman who changed the way she thought about money and how it made an impact in her life and her business. I first got started in photography a little over five years ago. I was working just a regular desk job. I had this dream and passion to get involved in photography. Meet Alicia Jevaharian. She's the owner and founder of Biba Photography. I got to a point where I was like, you know, this is growing so much. I know I need to make a transition from full-time work into part-time work so that I can pursue this dream. I told myself, I was like, you know, it's either going to be now or never. And I don't want to look back and say, what if? So I need to make that transition. So I quit my full-time job. I went to part-time at my desk job. And then I went more part-time into photography. I'm going to pursue this thing. And then it came to the point about a year and a half ago where I felt God nudging on my heart. After working part-time in both her job and on her photography business, Alicia decided to make the move to work on her dream full-time. Even though she knew what she needed to do, Alicia was scared. I was like, no way, Lord, there's no way I'm going to do this. How am I going to afford this? And how do I know that I'm going to have a paycheck? And that's when I felt like he was telling me that it's not my employer that pays my paycheck. It's him that provides for me. I had kind of a panic moment. Again, I can't do this, Lord. And what about my emergency fund? Dave Ramsey said I have to have an emergency fund. And what am I going to do? And within that weekend, I had my full emergency fund. And I said, okay, God, what about encouragement? How do I know I'm supposed to do this? And I had a slew of people just encouraging me. This is your gifting. This is your calling. And I'm like, gosh, I got to do this. Okay made the transition, and now I'm entering into almost my sixth year as a full-time photographer. I love what I do. As Alicia's business expanded, she had to reevaluate her pricing model. One of the big obstacles that I had going into full-time business was in the area of pricing. When I first transitioned, it was transitioning from a hobby job into this is my full-time career, this is something I have to depend on. Alicia realized that she was incredibly underpriced. I realized that, especially in my first year, <laughs> that I wasn't charging enough to be sustainable or to be profitable as a full-time photographer and took a really hard look at my numbers. I wrote down, you know, the bills I had, the things I wanted to do with my life, things like retirement that photographers don't think about, and just all the different areas of what do I need to do in order to live the life that I want to live. And I had to make a hard decision to go up 
quite a bit in my pricing, and I actually went up about five times what I was at last year. And I realized that I wasn't valuing myself, I wasn't valuing the gifts that God gave me, and I wasn't valuing my future to actually serve my clients. I needed to make a change, or I needed to go back to a desk job. She was worried about losing clients, but the pricing change has been good for Alicia's business. A lot of my clients are actually like, you know what, we love who you are, we're just going to flex to your new numbers because, you know, I've built that relationship with them and they like what I do. So (laughs) it's been good. The other clients that are not able to afford, I've had some other options to be flexible with them. But I realized that different people are going to be at different price points based on, you know, where they value money. Do they value the money itself or do they value the translation of money into an experience? Those are the people that are my target market that are looking for that experience and that wow and that emotion. And it was so freeing for me once I got past the point of, oh, I have to be everything to everybody. I have to make my style for them. I have to make my prices for them. I have to do everything for what they're looking for. And then setting into, this is who I am. This is what I provide. And now it sells itself because they see it and they connect with it. She has seen extreme levels of growth. My numbers where I was at last year, I had a really steady flow of clients. What I was making of all of last year, I've already made about that much in the first three months of business, which has happened because I made a pricing transition and I went up about five times what I was at last year. Alicia had a breakthrough when she adjusted how she viewed money. Listening to Rabbi Lappin say something about money, that money is neither evil nor good. It's amoral. It's something that's just a thing. It's a tool. Once I hit onto that, I started being okay with actually charging more. That's kind of where I transitioned from charging what I thought was just, an, I just kind of threw out a random number because that's what you do when you first start business, <laughs> you know, and you're not educated on it, um, to actually charging what I need to be in order to be sustainable and profitable. And when she focused on her branding and identity as a business and on her target market. What really I feel helped nail things down is I really nailed down my branding. I actually wrote down different brand names. There's Walmart, there's Target, there's Sears, there's Nordstrom's, there's Saks Fifth Avenue. Not everybody is going to shop at each of those different stores. And for me, it was kind of not, oh, I have to fit that mold or I have to fit this one, but what do I need to create? And then I go find those clients. And that was just the biggest transition for me is being who I am, being who God made me to be, and then finding the right people and attracting those right people to what I do rather than trying to attract everybody to me. Alicia creates her own opportunities and doesn't let rejection get her down. You just have to keep talking about it. I always have my business cards with me. I'll be at a store and I'll hear someone mention, oh, I'm going on my honeymoon or in whatever. And I'll ask, oh, you're getting married? Do you have a photographer, you know? And talk to them and I'll whip out my phone and show pictures. And so I'll show them, this is what I do. And they get locked into it. And they're like, oh, I want that for myself. Alicia gets to know her potential customers even before they become a client. For me, what's really, really important is building relationships and establishing that and focusing on customer relationship kind of building. And once that happens, once you get that momentum, about 90 to 95% of my business is referral based. So it's kind of generated itself where it's, hey, I love my session with her. You've got to go try her out. Her key to success has been focusing on how she can serve her customers. Again, building relationships is so important. If I hear, you know, my client is going through something, I'm going to contact them. I'm going to reach out to them on that. It's not just what I can get from people. And I think that was something that transitioned my business when I first started. I didn't know any better, so I thought, it's what I can get from people. What can I, you know? And then once I transitioned from what can I get to what can I give, that's really when I saw the doors open, when it was more about what can I invest into their lives. She wants to make an impact in her customers' lives. I love telling stories and people's stories. And so for me, it was important to start introducing really quality product. Let's tell your guys a story. Let's tell it visually through pictures. And that's the most powerful part. One of my biggest selling points is I create um, a custom slideshow set to music. I find out about their story before their photo session. And I work it into that. And about 90 to 95% of moms and dads are sitting there bawling their heads off because it's touching something. It's telling who they personally are. And that, I think, is so powerful. And once I tapped into that, again, is when I really started to see a transition and a change happen. And it's really exciting. Fear has been something Alicia has faced. But she did what I encourage everyone to do. She did it scared. I've dealt with fear my entire life. 
and people that do know me from you know years ago they don't recognize who I am because I've been transitioned from fear to faith and something that really changed my life about six years ago is I met this random woman in the library. We were both in the entrepreneurial section and we're like, oh, what kind of books are you looking for? You know, we connected as friends and she mentioned something that her little girl said. And I really feel like God used that to transition and change everything I do in life. It's something I constantly repeat to myself. She said, mommy, why don't you do it afraid? And for me, that was the biggest thing. I said, you know what? She's absolutely right. And I start to think that every time I become afraid, why don't you just do it afraid, you know? I always tell people that if you have something in your heart, your stomach is gonna do belly flops and you're gonna freak out. But if you have something, the thing is, what's worse? Is it worse conquering your fear or is it worse not ever knowing if it's gonna work out? And then the worst that's gonna happen, let's say you try it, you may get a little rejection, it's not gonna kill you. And I heard somewhere that fear is kind of like shadows against the wall. The closer you walk to it, the smaller they get on the wall. But the farther you back up and fear from it, the bigger they get and they become overwhelming and life consuming. And I found that each time you take a step toward fear, it does diminish and get smaller. She has made goals and hit them. She is living her dream. I love that I'm able to serve people through what I do. A lot of people think that you have to be in ministry in order to effectively reach out to people. And a lot of my clients actually share very deep things with me, and I love that I'm able to connect with them. Wow, what a great example to follow. If you have a success story relating to your beliefs around money that you'd like to share with the business boutique community, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email with your story to podcast at businessboutique.com and we'll be in touch. Okay, here's your homework for this episode, and it's a fun one. This month at businessboutique.com slash podcast, we're giving away $1,000 so that you can jumpstart or grow your business. All you have to do to enter is go to businessboutique.com slash podcast, subscribe to the podcast, and share your email address. That's it. Y'all, that's easy enough. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Go to businessboutique.com slash podcast, subscribe to the podcast, and share your email address, and you will be entered to win $1,000 to jumpstart or grow your business. All right, before we close, I want to encourage you to make it a priority to connect with our Business Boutique podcast community. You can go to businessboutique.com slash podcast, and in the comments section to this episode, I want you to reach out to each other and encourage each other. Let's all strive to meet our goals together. Now that's it for this week. Thanks for hanging out with me as always. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. For more encouragement on how to make money doing what you love, visit businessboutique.com. Mercy Me is coming to Pittsburgh, the Together Again tour with Mercy Me, Crowder, and special guest Andrew Ripp, Thursday, October 5th. Bring your family and friends to the PPG Paints Arena in Pittsburgh for Mercy Me, Crowder, and Andrew Ripp live in concert. Three multiple award-winning artists on one stage for one night. Let your spirit soar, your heart sing, and your faith ignite. Mark your calendars for Thursday, October 5th. Get your tickets now at mercyme.org.